buying high dividend stocks provided a cushion against the huge sell-off in stocks in 2022. So in this video, we'll look at that period of outperformance, but also consider the long-term outperformance of high income as a strategy. Then we turn to income right now for funds both in the UK and in the US, and then we'll consider the risks you have to take to generate that high yield. Now, don't forget that if you do enjoy our content, please do subscribe to our channel. That way you won't miss any new content. So let's look at high income funds in a bit more detail. Let's begin by considering whether high income is a good long term strategy. Certainly over the last year or so, it's been a great strategy. So here you can see high dividend yield, which is a Vanguard fund, since the end of 2021. You can see that that actually has made up all of its losses over the course of 2022 already. Whereas if we look at two growth funds, large cap growth in the US and small cap growth, both of those are down by about a fifth compared to where they were at the end of 2021. So yes, during this sell-off, growth has been the target and high income has been the resilient style of investing. But what's fascinating is if you push the analysis back further, and here I'm using the Simba spreadsheet from the Bogleheads forum, what you can see beside me are the total returns. It includes reinvested dividends, and these are real returns adjusted for inflation. Now, if you look at global equity, that's what you get with this VT Wax Fund, the total world market Vanguard Fund. That's returned on average 6% above inflation since 1976. But notice that high dividend yield, which is the VHYAX fund from Vanguard, has generated an additional 1.8% on average over that period. Now, is that a recent phenomenon? Well, no. Actually, it's been a fairly steady outperformance over that period. So if we take the value of the high dividend yield fund and divide it by the value of the total world stock index fund, then you can see that it's been gradually moving upwards since 1976. So this has been a period of steady outperformance for a strategy which a lot of people didn't even consider until quite recently. The last decade's been all about mega cap growth. Well, actually, maybe we should look further and consider yield as a better contender for long term investing. Now, when we're comparing different funds, how do we compare their income when their prices are different? What we do is we use a measure called dividend yield. And the way that works is we divide the dividends paid, say over the last 12 months, by the price we pay for the fund today. Now, as income investors, we want the dividends paid, the numerator, to be as large as possible. And ideally, we'd like to pay as little as possible, that's the denominator, as possible. But when we express these two numbers as a percentage, then that's the dividend yield. And we want it to be as high as possible. One caveat is that if the stock price has crashed recently, that does artificially inflate the dividend yield. So that's something to look out for when you see high dividend yields. Now, why is it that some stocks pay very high dividend yields and others don't? Well, that's purely at the discretion of the company's management. When they have their profits at the end of the year, dividends are one of the ways in which they can spend them. And that means that they're paying back their shareholders some of their profits. Alternatively, they can buy back some of their own shares. And this has been a very popular way to repay shareholders in the US, where it has a favourable tax treatment. In the UK, in contrast, high dividend payments are usually favoured rather than share buybacks. Alternatively, the company can plough its profits back into growing the company, reinvesting in its infrastructure, say, in order to scale up its future profits. So depending on how management distributes its profits amongst these three options, it can scale the dividend up or down. High return usually comes with a high risk. So what are the risks we're taking with these high income funds? Well, if we're buying fixed income funds, those contain bonds, then we're considering duration risk as one of the main ones. This is how long on average the fund locks up a fixed rate of interest. That's because if interest rates increase, you're missing out on that upside. And so the price of your fund will fall. So long duration risk means very volatile fixed income funds. So when we're comparing bond funds, we typically look at the duration of the fund itself. If the fund contains corporate bonds or maybe emerging market sovereign bonds, 
we're worried that some of those bonds won't repay our capital because the issuer will go bankrupt or repudiate its debt. So there we're thinking about credit risk. Will we get repaid? So there the credit rating is very important. And that's what we'd look at when we're assessing the risk of the fund. If the fund contains equity, well, we know that's very volatile. If it's emerging market equity, it'll be even more volatile. So by looking at the sectors, but also the country distribution of the stocks we're buying, we can also have a gauge of what kind of risk we're taking. Inflation is a risk for every investment, and particularly for fixed income funds, it can be a risk because it's like kryptonite for normal government bonds, say. That's because you've fixed your rate of return, and if inflation starts to rise, it's going to eat away at those returns. Normally with equity, the profits of a company scale up with inflation. So it does provide a limited inflation hedge, not so for fixed income. If you have inflation linked bonds, at least that way, you do have some protection against inflation. However, if inflation starts to fall, it's going to hurt your inflation linked bonds. And in some countries, there's no inflation floor on the bonds that you buy in the UK, for example, whereas in the US, these bonds do have an inflation floor. So deflation can be toxic for inflation-linked bonds. And then finally, we'd consider liquidity risk. And that means that the things in the fund are very difficult to sell. They take a long time to sell. So you might actually have the fund gated. That means you can't pull out your money as the market's collapsing. That might happen, for example, if you have a property fund, which tends to be quite a liquid and is subject to market crashes. Now, these aren't all the risks, but I'd say these are the primary risks you consider when investing in funds, particularly high income funds. Let's look at where we stand right now in terms of income from UK exchange traded funds. Why do I say right now? Well, that's because income changes all the time. But what's really important is that prices change too. So this isn't a static picture. Dividend yields change all the time. What I've done beside me here is I've taken the largest UK exchange traded funds. I've looked at the ones which are denominated in sterling and I've broken it down by the type of fund. In other words, what asset class the fund buys. And what these box plots show is the median yield. So you can think of that as the typical income. That's the vertical line here. But it also shows the spread of potential income for all of the funds in that category. So for Brazil equity, you can see that there's probably just one fund. That's why it's just a vertical bar. Whereas for inflation linked bonds in the US, you can see that there's quite a big dispersion of yields. But overall, those yields tend to be very high. The median is above 7.5% right now. So really, you have to choose the exposures that you want. At the moment, you get high Latin American equity yield. But of course, there you've got political risk and it is EM country, so there's also a currency risk if those currencies were to devalue due to a huge crisis, say. Energy as well is also generating a quite high dividend yield, as are US high yield bonds. And there you're taking corporate bond credit risk. So always you have to look at the risk and say, does this give me sufficient compensation for taking that risk? Down at the bottom of the table, you can see that generally it's developed markets which generate the smallest yields. And of course, investment grade debt, which you can see here with the USD corporate bonds, those will also generate smaller yields. Another way of measuring the risk of a fund is to look at its price volatility. That's a typical annual percentage move of the fund. Generally, equity tends to be much more volatile than bonds. And so you can see the equity funds on the right hand side of this graph and the bond funds on the left. That's the low volatility region. And on the y axis, I've plotted the dividend yield or the income of the fund with high income at the top and low income at the bottom. There's also a table of tickers here so you can look up these symbols. So, for example, IPRP has a very high volatility and that's a euro property fund. And you can see that its volatility is more than 30 percent. Whereas if we look at SEMB, which is an emerging market bond fund, that has much lower volatility and it actually has a higher yield. So this is the trade-off we'd consider. What kind of volatility do you get, as well as other risks, compared to the income which you receive? Now, for our PensionCraft website members, we have a new set of trackers available which allow you to monitor income as it changes over time. 
So this is the one for UK exchange traded funds. This is what it looks like in practice, and it's interactive. Now, the idea here is that the size of these rectangles shows you how large the fund is. So the largest fund here is the ISF FTSE 100 tracker. And you can also see the structure of the funds according to their asset type. So this is UK large cap equity. These are other bonds. These are global emerging market equities. And I've color coded it so green is low income all the way up to deep red, which is the highest income. So you can see that we've got quite a few red funds in the other bond category. So let's drill into that. And you can see that the EMHG fund, which is an ETF, is the largest fund, which has a fairly respectable income of 5.7% right now. So if you want access to these trackers, don't forget you can learn more about our membership at pensioncraft.com. And there'll also be a link in the description beneath me so that you can learn more. Now let's turn to UK funds or open-ended investment companies as they're called in the UK. Here's the breakdown by asset type. And again, you can see inflation linked bonds are way up at the top of the table. And that's because inflation has been very high recently and it's inflated the coupons which are paid for UK inflation linked bonds. Sterling denominated high yield bonds are also well up in the table as are emerging market bonds, both local currency and ones which are hedged back into sterling. Now, because the UK is such a generous dividend payer, UK equity income is also well up in the table with yields which are typically not much less than 5%. Again, if you use our trackers, you'll be able to drill into UK funds. So to switch, we just change from UK ETFs to UK funds, and now we can drill into those categories. Notice that UK large cap equity is mostly green, so it doesn't have the highest yields. But other categories certainly do have pretty high yields right now. For example, sterling corporate bonds. Here's the Fidelity Sustainable Money Builder Income Fund. That's got a yield of 4.5%, for example. And if we drill into this category, which is emerging market bonds, again, you can see there's a lot of red in this category. This also has high yields. Now let's turn to US exchange traded funds that generate a high income. Notice that the top category here, when we break it down by asset type, is MLPs or Master Limited Partnerships, where the median yield is a very high 8%. You can think of these as ways of paying for infrastructure for fossil fuel transportation in the US. That could be crude oil, it could be processed oil, or it could be natural gas. But these are very tax efficient structures in the US for funding that kind of infrastructure. And usually they have a very high dividend yield, as they do right now. Once we move to large cap blend equities, you can see that the income is much lower there. It's less than 5% typically. And high yield bonds in the US also are not generating huge yields right now. But there are some outliers here which are generating yields which are quite high. Preferred stocks and convertible bonds also are generators of high yield. And as we saw for the UK earlier, emerging market bond funds also generate pretty high dividend yields right now. Now in the US generally, dividend payout ratios tend to be quite low. So if you look at all cap equities, it's below 4% typically. So you're not gonna get a lot of income that way from US stocks. But there are lots of specialist funds which will generate those yields if you are willing to take some form of risk. And here too, you can use our tracker, which is for income, if you select US ETFs. And this will allow you to keep up to date right now with what's going on with US income. So here you can see it broken down by category. And for example, you can see that for large cap blend equities, there are a couple of funds which are generating high income. For example, Jeppy, which sells call options on the upside in order to enhance the income of the fund. And if we look in the bottom right, you can see those MLPs, which also have high dividend yields. In conclusion then, there's no question that high income funds have really protected your portfolio over the last year during the course of 2022. But this isn't just a flash in the pan. If we look further back in time, all the way back to the late 70s, you can see that high income has been a very good strategy and has beaten global equity overall. All I'd say is if you are going to tilt your portfolio towards very high income, be aware of the risks. Understand the risk of the funds you're buying and don't just rush into something because it has a high dividend yield, because it may create capital losses if we enter a troublesome period.
Now, it's easy to get drawn into recency bias and just assume that because growth has hugely outperformed every other style for a decade, that'll continue. Remember what's worked well in the past have been styles like small cap value, but also high dividend income. So I think personally, this is certainly something that you should consider as a tilt in your portfolio, if only because it will provide protection if markets don't continue rallying towards the end of 2023. Now, don't forget our offer. You'll get access to those trackers so you can see exactly what the dividend yields are, both in the US and the UK right now, and to continue to monitor that into the future. So if you want to get access to that, just go to our website, pensioncraft.com, and there'll also be a link in the description beneath me. And as always, thank you for listening.